Welcome to Reformation Presbyterian Church. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates, sermons, catechism, and method of prayer. This recording is property of Reformation Presbyterian Church. Come worship with us in Nampa. www.reformationpres.org Welcome to Reformation Presbyterian Church. This is the Lord's Day, April 16th, 2023, and the week after the resurrection of Christ. So we have the first bit in the life of the church is the our prayer for peace in the land. But Jeffrey Ventrella, my wife, has found out because she is good at online presence stuff, has moved back to town. And I'm pretty sure he's working for the Attorney General's office. So he used to be working for Alliance Defending Freedom. And now he says that he's working for the Attorney General of Idaho. He used to live in the area and go to Presbyterian Church. We can be praying for him and his work because I know the Attorney General in Idaho has taken a turn for the good and is trying to defend morality in the civil sphere which is always a step in the right direction so we're thankful that they're even hiring men like jeffrey ventrella if i'm not mistaken he was going to an opc wherever it was that he lived i could be wrong about that but my wife is rarely wrong so i think i'm right um, so also our men's bible study we're going to resume this week 7 a.m at Alchemus overland and it's week 11, but since we spent an extra week on Holy Scripture and I took the week off for my trip with my wife for our anniversary, we're at week 11, but we're on chapter 9. So this is accurate. I made sure to, to make sure the weeks and the chapters number 9 were lined up. Live stream starting, subscribe to YouTube and Twitch. So we cannot live stream on YouTube unless we have 50 subscribers so we're gradually gaining however we would like to just stream through youtube i think because that's where all of our videos we are working on have been posted and but currently we're working on our twitch feed so those of you online who are tuning in by twitch our live stream starting today we tried to get started last week and that just didn't work out too well so i think we're working this week and you can go to reformationpresbyterian.org and there's a link in our live stream section for our twitch live stream the this is the sunday before the biblical worldview conference so this coming friday and Saturday, April 21st and 22nd, will be the Biblical Worldview Conference. And we have two guest speakers from out of town, one from the South, John Eidsmo, Lieutenant Colonel John Eidsmo, pastors of PCA Church, but he is our, an ordained Lutheran minister. We love him, we've known him for years. This is the 38th year of the Biblical Worldview Conference. I believe there's still some registrations available, and those who want to attend should. Also, Israel Wayne, who is a prolific Christian author, father, and the family renewal is his ministry. And he is quite the well-known nationwide homeschool conference speaker. In fact, when we lived in Greenville, he came and we visited with him. Just after he did the conference, the, the, he came to our house. So prayer is on the 19th, which is this week. So Wednesday night at 6 o'clock at our house. Please be in prayer for all these issues and the folks. And so also we have job search, Mike Ferrari, who we've been in contact with. He has some job loss, and so he's looking for a job manufacturing. And then also Josh Royce, who is a longtime friend. He's applying for a job with Idaho Power. So we're very close, finishing up negotiations, I think, with the location for morning worship. So that's really exciting. I think we are ready to go on to our silent prayer devotion and just take a moment to prepare your heart to meet the presence of the living and true god in his word and in worship as we respond to his word and to his promises and and to his instructions for our life let's take a moment in prayer please rise and hear the call to worship from matthew 11 verse 28 
Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We hear the Lord's blessing. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. Let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, our true God, we pray, Lord, that you would grace us with your presence. We think back to the time when you directed Moses to build a tabernacle for your presence to dwell in and how he had gone up the mountain to speak to you for his people and went came down the mountain to speak to your people on your behalf, Lord. And we think today of the great blessing that we have a mediator in Jesus Christ and he's ascended up the mountain Zion. And he is now representing us before your throne. But it is not by our doing that we sent him there to represent us, just as Israel sent Moses. But we have a greater mediator who you sent to us to represent yourself to us, and who now you have appointed and glorified to your right hand. And he represents us by your will. We respond in thankfulness and in awe, Lord, that you would think so highly of your creation, that you would place your image in us and think so highly of your promises that you would save us through your Son. We pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us. Even this day, speak to us. And just as uh, Jesus represents us to you in the throne of grace, we pray that he would speak to us as our prophet through the Holy Spirit and he would fill our hearts and that he would come knocking today knocking with his gospel of grace and that all those who hear would open and that they would enjoy his coming in and his blessing them with his mercy and his peace and his assurance of salvation in Jesus name we pray amen yeah. Please join me now in our hymn of adoration, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, verses 1 through 3. There's six verses. We're going to be singing verses 1 through 3 in Psalm 72b. Hail to the Lord's Anointed. Hail to the Lord's Anointed, great Amen. Amen. Please be seated. 
turning to page 976, 976, page 976, questions 102 and 103 of the Shorter Catechism. And one of the key aspects that we come upon in questions 102 and 103 is that we are praying different things in the Lord's Prayer. And in question 102, it deals with the things that we are seeking, that we are petitioning of God. It says, what do we pray for in the second petition? In 103, what do we pray for in the third petition? The second petition is thy kingdom come, and it's a prayer, part of our prayer, that we would want God's kingdom. We would ask for him to send his kingdom come. That's what Jesus is teaching his disciples, is that that they need to want his kingdom to come. They need to ask for it. And in question 103, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we would want God's will to be done. Not our will, not what we think is right in the earth, but God's will as he knows what he has in store for his creation. He knows what he wills for his people and his earth. And he has his way in heaven, and we want him to have his way here as well. We can have heaven on earth. So let's read. I will read the question out loud, and we can read the answers together. Christian, what do we pray for in the second petition? In the second petition, which is thy kingdom come, we pray that Satan's kingdom may be destroyed and that the kingdom of grace may be advanced, ourselves and others brought into it and kept in it, and that the kingdom of glory may be advanced. Christian, what do we pray for in the third petition? In the third petition, which is, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, we pray that God, by his grace, would make us able and willing to know, obey, and submit to his will in all things, as the angels do in heaven. Join me now in our hymn of praise, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Trinity Psalter Hymnal 300. Ah! Uh -huh. 
God, our giving of thanks, our giving of tithes, and we remember simply that God commands us to determine in our own heart what to give, for God loves a cheerful giver. And you may be convicted by scripture that you give 10% of your income to the Lord. You may be convicted that you would give your first fruits, but also there are those like the widow who gave one mite, one penny, and it was all she had. And Jesus said she gave more than those who gave out of the great riches of their lives because she gave all that she had. So there's really no one percentage or one number. We just give out of a great thankfulness to God for what bounty he has wrought in our lives and in our souls. Join me in our hymn of thanks. Jesus lives and so shall I. Trinity Psalter hymnal 512. Jesus lives and so shall I. Jesus lives and so shall I. Death thy sting is gone for. Trans into glory. 
Genesis 9 and Psalm 72. And in Genesis 9, we're going to start in verse 18. We left off in verse 17. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Noah began to be a farmer. And he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told two of his brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Turning now to Psalm 72, a psalm of Solomon. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. His days the righteous shall flourish in abundance of peace. Until the moon is no more, he shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Those who dwell in the wilderness will bow before him and his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all the kings shall fall down before him. All the nations shall serve him. For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and the needy, and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence, and precious shall be their blood in his sight. And he shall live, and the gold of Sheba will be given to him. Prayer also will be made for him continually, and daily he shall be praised. There will be an abundance of grain in the earth. On the tops of the mountains, its fruit shall wave like Lebanon, and those of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. New Testament readings begins with Romans chapter 6, and here we read these words. What shall we say then? 
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Mm. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died sin once and for all. But the life that he lives to God, <coughs> likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, but you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as <coughs> slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness in the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now turning to Second Peter chapter 2, we will begin at verse 10 and read through 22. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviving accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak of the evil things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who counted pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accused, accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb don donkey speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. <clears throat> for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness 
the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in air. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them. According to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. That's why the reading of God's word. Let us join in prayer for illumination as we prepare to hear the preaching of this word. Father God, we come before you and we join with the psalmist who says your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Father, that is our heart's commitment that we would walk in the light and lamp of your word to this world. But Father, we are in darkness and in ignorance when your word is kept from us, but here it can be spoken and preached and taught. And Father, we can have it before us and read it, and with your Holy Spirit, our hearts and minds can be illuminated. And as Lord, as in this service, we approach this time of teaching, we pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts, our ears and our minds, that we would hear with understanding the truth of your word, for your word is true, and that it would do a work in our hearts, that we would be able to walk in your statutes in this world. Father, bless he who brings you word. Open his mouth that he speaks those words that you would inspire and lead him to teach. Thank you for this opportunity to hear and understand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Please join me in our song of preparation, I Have Followed Truth, 119P. I have followed truth and justice, sermon tonight is sin and bondage sin and bondage you may have followed some of those themes through some of the readings tonight Um, in both second peter 2 and in romans 6 it talks about the bondage of sin and that is a recurring theme the theme of genesis 9 verses 18 through 28 is that even after god's judgment of the flood Humanity continues to sin and is still in bondage to sin. This is evident in the story of Noah's descendants. The fall of Ham and Canaan is a reminder of the total depravity of man. It's a reminder that humanity is still in need of redemption. 
In Genesis 9, we see the consequences of sin. After the flood, God makes a covenant with Noah and his descendants. In this covenant, God promises never to destroy the world with a flood again. But he also makes it clear that sin still has consequences. If we sin, we will be punished, and that's exactly what happens. After the prohibition of murder of the Imago Dei, we see the corruption of Noah's descendants. Ham, one of Noah's sons, sees Noah naked and scoffs at his father's sin, and so Noah curses Ham's son, Canaan. He says that Canaan will be a slave to his brothers. This curse is often used to justify slavery. The story of Noah's descendants is a reminder to us that we need to be careful not to fall into the same traps that they did. We need to be aware of the power of drunkenness and porneia and the bondage that sin brings. If you, Christian, submit to the temptation to sin, you will live in bondage to sin. The message of this passage, Christian, is that if you submit to the temptation to sin, you will live in bondage to sin. Our first point is directed at parents based on Noah and his activities in verses 18 through 22. Parents, if you submit to the temptation to sin, then you will suffer like Noah did. Let's look at verse 18. It says that now the sons of Noah went out of the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three, they were the sons of Noah. And the whole earth was populated. This is a picture of the new creation, of being fruitful and multiplying, obeying God's commands. And a new order has been established, a, a sin-cleansed world. Noah is one of eight souls selected for the renovation of the church, John Calvin says. Such a debasing alienation, such a debasing alienation of mind in the prince of the new world and the holy patriarch of the church could not less astonish them than if they had seen the ark itself broken, dashed in pieces, cleft asunder and destroyed. We are seeing the foundering of Noah upon the rocks of sin. Calvin is saying, and his sons watched with astonishment at his debased alienation of mind, this prince of the new world. And we see that there are other examples in scripture of holy men who become corrupt and give in to sin and disobedience. David and his sons in 2 Samuel 11 through 20 David was a man after God's own heart. He was the king of Israel, but he committed adultery with Bathsheba, a sexual sin. And he orchestrated the death of her husband Uriah, a murderous plot. Later, his son Absalom rebelled against him, leading to a civil war that nearly tore the kingdom apart. David's sins led to the sins of his sons. Isaiah 14, 21, prepare slaughter for his sons because of the guilt of their fathers, lest they rise and possess the earth and fill the face of the world with cities. And Isaiah is saying that this is a logical consequence of the sins of parents, that the fathers are guilty and the children go off the rails. A lot like what we see in the story of Noah. This passage is a prophecy against the king of Babylon, but also alludes to the curse of Canaan, whose descendants were said to be cursed for their father's sin. The idea here is that the descendants of the wicked will suffer for the sins of their ancestors. Men and their sons will be punished for their sins. Eli and his sons, 1 Samuel 2 through 4. Eli was a priest and judge in Israel, but his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were corrupt and greedy, taking advantage of their positions to commit sexual immorality in the gates of the temple. And they're stealing from the offerings. As a result, God punished Eli's family Hophni and Phinehas, they would die in battle and would also lead to the downfall of Eli himself. The Bible describes it almost in comical terms as the, the little fat man who fell over and broke his neck. 
as if he had just given in to his carnal desires and grown fat and was so cursed by God that for how he had raised his sons inappropriately, he did not was not a good father. And thus he was, even though he was a man of God, he was himself brought down by his sin. The application here that we should take away, men of the church, is that there is one heinous sin, at least, that's poisoning your home. And I ask you to search your hearts for what that sin might be. And who knows what it was. In Eli's life, he is condemned for not calling his sons out of their sins, but surely they learned it from their father. Even priests are their, and their sons are punished for their sins. Aaron and his sons in Leviticus 10, this is a great, after the great inauguration of the tabernacle and the establishment of the sacrificial rites and Aaron's sons. Aaron was the first high priest in Leviticus 10. This may be even be the first day of the work of Aaron and his sons as a high priest that his sons Nadab and Abihu went in and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord and were struck dead for their sin. And even holy men can have wayward or disobedient children and the consequences of such behavior can be severe. These consequences also underscore the importance of personal responsibility and accountability as well as need for repentance and reconciliation with God. The, the current crimes that have happened in some churches, especially the Roman Catholic Church, priests abusing people and abusing their station, even children. These are not new things. We have seen this even in scripture, that people in positions of authority have fallen and been tempted by their sin. And there's another application for parents. What are you doing, parents, that encourage sin in your children? Are you failing to discipline them as Eli did? Are you setting a bad example like David did in his violent affair? Or are you like Aaron and your children may just be responsible for their own sin? Although he did have uh, allow unauthorized creation of golden calves, so maybe they were saying, my dad was innovating in his time, even though he did clearly get in trouble for that. They should not have followed his example. And this is also helpful for <clears throat> the elders of the church. Even elders who are sinners are responsible for the discipline of the church. There are real consequences for you as elders, as leaders, as pastors. And you have to, however, still keep discipline in the church. Aaron did not quit being a leader in the church. God didn't remove him from office. He could have, but he didn't. Eli, even though he spent many years as a father of Hophni and Phinehas, he also helped raise Samuel. And so we don't forget that, the, that our sins don't always, sometimes they will, but they don't always disqualify us. And sometimes we need to repent and we need to work um, for the discipline and the good of the church. So <clears throat> we encourage our elders in their sins because we even know Paul says that he himself was a sinner that they would confess and continue their good work that God has called them to we if we if we expect our elders to be perfect men we'd have no elders application for members of the church if an elder has an unruly child is it appropriate for you to scorn and undermine your authorities leave it to God to remove them even David said that he would not remove God's anointed if they repent and remain in leadership then that's worth respecting and God will remove them. Far too many. I hear, almost every week I hear another church where ex-elder has a kid who's apostate and you don't know. You don't know that you should be praying for that elder and helping him seek reconciliation with that apostate. And you don't know that child isn't called by God and isn't going through a period of temptation, just like the prodigal child. And members of the church is not your responsibility if you're in a Presbyterian church government, we have pastors who are over other pastors and it is their responsibility to hold each other accountable. But members of the church, I would encourage you to be patient and respect those who are worth respecting. Also, elders, it's good to 
remember that our example is critical to the flock and there are weaker members of the church who rely on our good conduct. We may have mature members of the church who can, in their maturity, overlook certain things in our lives, but there are weaker members of the church who, who need us to really live to that higher standard and be above reproach. And we need to do, we need to live those holy lives for their sake because they are weak in their faith and they can quickly jump to conclusions that are uncharitable and uh, make accusations against us that, that are not right but understandable in their immaturity. Christian, do you think God gives us examples of holy men falling in scripture to tell us that it's okay? It's okay. This is the take-home lesson from God that it's okay to sin, sin it up a little bit. Or do you think that God's instructing us, graciously teaching us by the example of others? And these are. This is a very hard passage to take. It touches on fathers. It touches on leaders of the church. It touches on people that we call perfect men in their generation. Noah was a tamim man. And God's showing us this picture immediately after the cleansing of the earth of all sin. Why would God do that except to help us grow in our understanding? And should we approach the godly men of Scripture with scorn as Ham and Canaan did? It really pains me so often to hear pastors or uh, Bible teachers say, so-and-so is just a big dummy. It's If Noah, who was a perfect man, was just a big dummy, then what are you? What am I? Let's get real. We're not a bunch of saints here. Certainly, I can't imagine anybody on this earth that's, that would qualify as for to be called a tummy man, a perfect man. This is something that should be instructive for us as sinners, just like Noah. Fathers, just like Noah. Uh, even pastors, just like Noah. And if your idea, fathers, is that there's bad dads in the Bible, then you can be a bad dad too. I know that there's books written called Bad Dads of the Bible. It's a cool, cool title to sell books. But it's not okay. You're not paying attention to the prohibition of scripture, of sin in scripture, if you think it's okay to sin it up a little bit. And that's one of the reasons we read Romans 6. Not only is it referring to the bondage of sin that's talked about in this passage, but he says, is it okay that we sin now? Is it okay that we sin, that grace can abound? That God's a gracious God, and I can make him more gracious. No, you can't. You cannot make God more gracious. He's as gracious as you could ever want him to be without you sinning ever again. You've already sinned enough. If you think God understands and he's seen it all before and yeah, Noah's worse than me and his kids are, my kids have never done anything like this and we're all doing pretty good. And You're asking for judgment and the bondage of sin to be brought upon yourself. Not judgment that's <coughs> eternal, although that's possibility but also in this life and that's really what we see here in in this passage is the promise of temporal punishment for no other reason please do what is right to avoid punishment in this life sexual sin is definitely a part of the picture of what's going on here the becoming uncovered and the nakedness and not looking at it says ham the father of Canaan saw he was looking at the nakedness of his father. And the word porneia is something that we have in the New Testament. It's used 25 times in the New Testament. It's listed among other sins in Galatians 5, which is where we see all the works of the flesh listed. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it's often paired with adultery and homosexuality. And there's lots of speculation amongst the commentators, what is going on here? You know, what's really happening? And it says, Noah woke and knew what his younger son had done to him. Does that indicate that he did something else, something really, something more heinous than scoffing and looking and laughing. And I don't think that we need anything more heinous. We know that porneia can be any kind of sexual immorality and we see it as a so significant that it's called the legitimate reason for divorce in Matthew 5.32. It's important for us to remember that we always say that one of the reasons for divorce is adultery, 
but it actually the word used in Matthew 5.32 and 19.9 is porneia, sexual immorality, sexual perversion. And it can lead to numerous other sins. We see it connected to violence, STDs, and pregnancy out of wedlock. Westminster Confession talks about the purpose of marriage as promoting a legitimate issue. And we also see that sex outside of marriage can cause immense societal harm. That's something I think that's worth repeating, especially in these passages where clearly we're talking about the emergence of a sexual immorality. And I think that's one of the things that God's doing in, this, in these chapters. He's pointing out we have violence, we have murder, and he's pointing out different kinds of sins. He's showing us sex, there's still sexual sin. That's a big problem. We have violence and murder, and these are all things that we need to be conscious of and we need to avoid, we need to run from them. And consider what damage the rise of sex outside of wedlock has done in our culture. Uh, giving us certainly cause for divorce, but also giving us multitudes of children outside of wedlock. Children who are raised without parents, who love them outside of a loving home, a, a man with a man and a woman. So much so that the family's been so discredited that now there's people making and have made for years arguments that even same-sex couples can have legitimate families that the family has been so destroyed by sexual sin that now the secular world says, ah, we don't even need it. We can have all sorts of perverse definitions of family. So the second point we have here in this passage, verse 24 through 26, and moving on from the sins of the fathers and drunkenness and sexual immorality is that the slavery is the consequence of sin. Bondage, those who do not resist the temptation of sin will live a life of bondage. Slavery is the consequence of sin. Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his younger son had done, and he said the following words. He said, this is the consequence. You're going to be cursed, you've sinned, you've broken the covenant of God, God's a covenant-making God, he just gave us the sign of the covenant, he gave us the order of the, of things that we would no longer murder and that would be a new ordinance and the new creation and here's another ordinance that if you sin in this way dishonoring your father and your mother committing some sort of sexual sin that you will be condemned to a life of bondage and he even repeats this and he notice how he says blessed be the lord the god of shem and he's making these familial distinctions he's saying the faithful line is the line of Shem, and now Ham and Canaan are entering into this unfaithful line, this line of unbelievers. And we know they're unbelievers because they didn't believe God when he put me in authority over these boys. And yes, I sinned, but that didn't excuse them from their own sins that they were responsible of. And slavery here is an analogy of the consequence of sin. Remember in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, we said that sin is any one of conformity to our transgression of the law of God. And so we said that sin is a want, it's a lack of righteousness, right? And so when we say that sin is slavery, we're saying that slavery is a type of deprivation. And even in philosophy, you would say that slavery is when you're being deprived of your freedom. And so here, slavery is an analogy, a very close analogy, and very much in line with what we see in the Westminster Confession and how you should understand sin, not as this creeping goo that goes throughout the, from world to world, from cosmos to cosmos, but not as a, an entity in and of itself, but as this deprivation, you've become depraved and deprived of righteousness. And it says here that the slavery, as the analogy, says that what you obey defines you. And if you obey sin, then it owns you. Romans 6.16, 6, don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. That's what Romans 6.16 says. <coughs> Romans 7.14 says, 
Sin is an identity issue. If we are unspiritual, we are sold out to and belong to sin. This is why we must not define ourselves as alcoholics or homosexuals, because if sin owns you, you do not belong to God. If you are spiritual, you belong to God. Romans seven fourteen. We know the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Every sin binds us to sin and death. It's as if you are bound, you're chained up to it, and it owns you. You are on its leash. This is why it's not too cute to say we are sinners and we can't help it. Yes, we are totally depraved, but that doesn't mean we identify with your sin as if it's like your buddy. It's not good to sin. It's not cute. It's a horror. John 8, 34, Jesus replies, Verily, very truly, or verily, verily, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin is slavery. It's not something cute. It's not something that you can cuddle up to. Sinners are free only with regard to being right. Sinners are free only with regard to being right. Sin is not a product of the benefits of a free will. It's not some sort of a wonderful thing that that frees you and now we know we're free because we sinned. That's what the Arminian view is. Somehow we were free to sin. No, we were, <laughs> we're free to do good things. You're bound. You're in bondage. You're not free when you're sinning. You're in bondage when you're sinning. Romans 6.20 When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. You weren't free to sin. You were free from righteousness. You are free from goodness, which is not the kind of freedom you want. Those who teach the freedom to sin are selling snake oil. It will kill you. It will not save you. It will control you. What besetting sin has ever improved our identity or strengthened our will? It controls us. It makes us weak. Second Peter 2.19 they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. That's what Peter's saying. He's saying that slavery is a curse for sin. We say that this is like a type of freedom. You're free to do whatever you want. This is the libertarian line. As long as you're not hurting somebody else, you're hurting yourself. They promise freedom. They promise you freedom. This is freedom. I have freedom, free choice over my own body to have abortions. I have the freedom to mutilate my body or to give my kids the permission to mutilate their bodies. I don't care if parents say that kids can mutilate their bodies or not. It should be illegal for anybody to have kids mutilate their bodies. And we are finally coming to our senses and saying there have to be some limitations to what we call freedom. Doing horrible, evil things is not freedom. That's not what made this country wonderful. You didn't see Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, they did wear funny wigs, but those were, the hairs, probably, those wigs probably cost a lot of money and were fashionable in those days. They weren't trying to look like ladies and have sex changes. They'd be the fire this thing, they'd be, I'm sure they would be outraged, more than outraged, at what we were doing in this country with the freedoms that they gave us. Matthew Henry says, Noah declares a curse on Canaan, the son of Ham. Perhaps his grandson of his was more guilty than the rest. And one thing we shouldn't take away from this is that there's generational sin. Matthew Henry avoids the problem of seeing the curse as generational here. He says, perhaps his grandson was more guilty than the rest. Canaan had done something here is what Matthew Henry is trying to say. It's not, oh, Ham, you did this, and now your son's going to get it. If that were true, then we wouldn't have had Solomon, because Solomon was David's son. Yes, his other kids did fall into their own sins, but they were responsible for their sins. They were following their dad's example, but they were responsible for what they did. In Reformed theology, we understand personal responsibility for sin. We do not believe that we're predestined to do wicked things. God does not want us to be wicked. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Man reaps what he sows. Very good example right there in Galatians 6. God cannot be mocked. You can't say that God's responsible for sin. And that it's okay. I was predestined for damnation. I've heard people say that. 
you are responsible for your own damnation. We are predestined to salvation, and you should beg God that you would be in that number. We are reprobation is very rarely only amongst hyper Calvinists do we ever hear reprobation as something that God has or predestined us to. We say He's foreordained us to damnation because we chose our sin and in the order of things we have chosen that path for ourselves that is, we the the supra lapsarians take a little bit harder line the infralapsarians for those of you who are familiar with those terms would understand that god predestines us to salvation and god cannot be mocked we are responsible. Proverbs 19.3, a person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. We raise the, rage against the Lord. You put me in this situation, God. If it weren't for you predestining me to be poor and born in the Bronx or wherever it was that you were born, you feel bad about. Born in Haiti, wherever it is, God is not responsible for your sin. Your own folly leads to your ruin not your circumstances. James 1, 14 through 15, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done well in the body, whether good or bad. Are there enough verses in scripture to convince you that you are personally responsible? And yes, scripture talks about predestination too, but you are not predestined to be evil. If you're predestined to anything, you're predestined to salvation. You're responsible for your own sin. God <laughs> saves those who he will. And you should pray out, cry out to God that you would be one of his, <coughs> that he had always planned to save. There are several parallel passage in, passages in the prophetic books that allude to the curse of Canaan in Genesis 9. Amos 9, 7, for those who are taking notes, we won't dwell on these a lot. Are you not like the Ethiopians to me, O people of Israel, says the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt? And this passage talks about the Israelites as opposed to the Ethiopians, who would be the descendants of Ham the, and the father of Canaan. So it suggests that Israelites were chosen for a special purpose while others were not. And that is part of this curse that we would understand Regarding the institution of slavery, we really need to address this because this is a proof text for justifying slavery. Matthew Henry argues that although slavery was a reality in Africa, excuse me, that does not make it a moral ordinance, but rather a curse. The whole quote, the whole continent of Africa was peopled mostly by the descendants of Ham, and for how many ages have the better parts of that country lain under the dominion of the Romans than of the Saracens and now of the Turks? He's saying that over throughout history so much of Africa has been put into bondage and into slavery and of the poor Negroes how many every year are sold and bought like beasts in the market and conveyed from one quarter of the world to do the work of beasts in another but this is in no way excuses the covetousness and barbarity of those who enrich themselves with the product of their sweat and blood God has not commanded us to enslave Negroes and without doubt he will severely punish all such cruel wrongs so even if this should be understood as Ham's descendants being those who peopled Africa, which is in debate, but even if that is true, Matthew Henry is saying that does not excuse our culpability if we choose to sin against these people and enslave them, and he will punish all such cruel wrongs. B.B. Warfield, the Bible does not teach that slavery is a divine institution. On the contrary, it teaches that slavery is a human institution and that it is a sin against God. The Bible teaches that all people are created in the image of God. That's actually what just was taught in this chapter. So to use this chapter to say these people are animals and we need to enslave them is actually not what Genesis 9 teaches. It teaches that Everybody is made in Imago Dei. And there is no ape race of humanity. There's not a separate genesis that God had black people evolve from monkeys. That is a discredited and unbiblical view. And even somebody like B.B. Warfield, who is 
reputed as a supporter of evolution didn't believe that. In fact, he was a staunch defender of the African American and the need for slavery to end. Slavery was a reality in the Near East, okay? So that's why the Bible is talking about slavery, because it was a reality in the Near East and it needed to be addressed biblically as an institution for the promotion of debt repayment. In fact, if you look in both Exodus 21 and in Deuteronomy, it talks about bonded slavery and how all such slavery was temporary and dependent upon repayment of the bond. And we use bonds today to encumber the taxpayers with that. We're all slaves to whoever owns treasury bonds, China. But they're slaves to their communist government too, so we're all just a bunch of slaves. Chattel slavery is a different institution in the American South. And that institution ignored the image of God and man and said understanding slaves as property, not image bearers. Exodus 21, 2. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year he shall go free without paying anything. <clears throat> Faithfulness of him, of Shem and Japheth. This is our last point. So we're actually going back up to verse 24. No, not 24. 23. In 23... It says that Shem and Japheth were the good sons and that they did not look on their father. They did not scoff at their father. They did not commit the sin. And how can they be a good example to us today? Shem and Ham, they resisted the temptation to dishonor their father, following the fifth commandment, honoring their authority. And we are to honor our authorities, even though there are some authorities who tow bills and send us off to war in this country without declaring war and think that we should have people running this country that are transvestites, we should still honor these people. And Tim Keller points out that when we resist temptation, we are honoring God and showing that we are his people. This is also something that is related to <clears throat> this activity of Shem and Japheth. They were also doing things that were the opposite of what Noah and Ham had done in terms of sexual sin. So Noah and Ham committed sexual sin, and Noah was naked, he was uncovered, and Ham was gazing on nakedness and committing porneia, and the, the Shem and Japheth were not. They were choosing to have the good portion. The Philistines and Canaanites, by the way, were especially known for their sexual depravity. One of the commentators says that this is a really apropos that Moses would identify the origin of some of this sexual sin. David Pallison points out, sexual sin is a serious offense against God. It's a violation of his design for sex and betrayal of our spouses if we are married. It's also a sin that can be forgiven and we can be restored from. And Shem and Japheth were ultimately blessed. He, Japheth was blessed, says that God would enlarge Japheth and he would dwell in the tents of Shem and that they would be his people, his faithful people. <clears throat> if you, Christian, this evening are struggling with sexual temptation, don't despair. There's hope for you. God wants you to overcome your sin. He's provided resources to help you, his word, his spirit, and the church. And please reach out for help and don't give up. Keep in mind that these sins are happening in the church. This is something happening in the church. If Noah and his sons and his family is considered the, the new church, the resurrected church after the flood, realize that there is hope for you in the church, that the church is here to minister to you and not to overlook your sin, overlook the sin of sexual immorality and drunkenness but to help you and to cover your sin jesus would cover our sins with his blood see a little bit of a a picture of the gospel here and what these two men have done honoring their father and covering his sin like jesus does for us christian there is forgiveness of sin we exchange the bondage of sin for the bondage of serving God. We are free to serve God, being bound to the reward of eternal life. Think about covenant theology. You either get bound to blessings or you get bound to curses. It's really simple. 
And even though it seems like odd to use, why would I be a servant to God if I'm free? Aren't I just free to do whatever I want? And then I promiscuously pay homage to God every once in a while. No, you're bound to goodness and eternal life. You want to be bound to goodness and eternal life and holiness. These are good things. You want to be bound to them. It's a wonderful thing. If I said that you could be bound to your favorite movie star, you know, for a whole day, or your favorite politician for a whole day, probably at the end of it you'd say, go home now. You wouldn't be enjoy being bound to them very much. But being bound to Jesus Christ and being bound to the source of all life can't imagine a much better binding on our life and on our hearts. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. Brothers and sisters, Genesis 9 is a story of God's mercy and grace. After the flood, God made a covenant with Noah and his descendants, promising never to destroy the earth again. He even gives Noah the rainbow as a sign of his renewed, resurrected covenant. Genesis 9 is a reminder that God's willing to give us a second chance on this earth. And when you come to the Lord, you've accepted that second chance. You've clung to Jesus Christ. But we must repent and turn away from our sins. This is a vibrant reminder to us. We must be willing to resist temptation in the very church or suffer a God, again the bond of bondage of sin. We are not holier than now and above reproach. We have to be careful and we have to be diligent. Sin is a powerful force that can lead us and our offspring into destruction, especially the sins of drunkenness and sexual immorality. These sins destroy relationships. They strike at the vitals of our health, STDs and liver failure. They curse our very lives. They destroy our families. If you're willing to repent and turn away from your sins, God's willing to forgive you and renew his covenant with you. And if not, you will suffer bondage to sin, even for generations, until those generations repent. Think about it. God didn't abandon the Gentiles. All of those who are in the line of Canaan, in Jesus Christ, the gospel was opened up even to them. Shem and Japheth, brothers and sisters, chose the better portion, the inheritance of life. They chose the new creation. It was right in front of them because they honored their father. They did not scoff at their father. And in contrast, they lived a life that's pleasing to God and glorifying him and resisting the temptation to sin. Let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, these are challenging truths. We stand in awe of your word that you would think so much of your people, that you would give us even these warnings that sin does lead to bondage. And that we shouldn't overinterpret these as passages condoning the wickedness of the curse, as if somehow the curse was a divine ordinance, Lord. We know that you've given us marriage and you've given us your Sabbath, but you didn't give us slavery as an ordinance, Lord, and we understand that. We know that you've warned us numerous times that Second Peter 2, and even in, in Romans 6, that we should beware of being slaves to sin, that we should beware of slavery as something that we should want to avoid, and that we should not see that Your grace is something that should be taken trivially and that we should not mock you by thinking that we can be in the church but mocking all of your ways, mocking your servants. And we pray, Lord, that as parents that we would seek out the things that we've done, moments of drunkenness and irresponsibility where our sins just lie bare before our children. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring us to repentance and that we would work diligently in the lives of our children to help them see your gospel and see the need for personal responsibility. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us covering. You've given us Jesus Christ who would shed his blood to cover our sins and that uh, just as you say in Isaiah 1 that you would have us come to you and that 
we would reason with you and that you would take our sins that are like scarlet and you'd make them white as snow. You'd cover us with white robes of glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Join me in our hymn of response, Jesus, lover of my soul. Trinity Psalter Hymnal 450. benediction not from Romans 15 from 2 Corinthians 13 the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all amen Amen. in our doxology hallelujah hallelujah 566 his praise proclaim Amen. Go with God.